What's going on smart people? In the last cross-section video, we did a lot of the conceptual heavy lifting that allowed us to see how under very limited circumstances, we can relate things like the size of the object, the cross-sectional area, our target, to experimentally measurable or controllable uh, quantities such as the number of scattering events in the experiment and properties of the beam such as its flux, its number density of particles, things like that. We also defined something called the differential cross-section, which in that same breath is kind of like a description of the shape of the object, the shape of the target. Now in that last video we stated that that interpretation becomes just absolutely wrong and really not even a very good approximation once we stop thinking of these processes as rigid bodies colliding and start thinking of them in terms of these interactions happening at a distance. Now, as a disclaimer, for this video, we're going to continue developing that conceptual understanding of cross-sections and differential cross-sections, but primarily in the context of nuclear and particle physics. We're going quantum in this video. So if you clicked on this video hoping for a comprehensive description of the classical cross-section, I'm going to have to refer you to Taylor's book on classical mechanics. He does a much better job in that scattering section in his book than I could ever hope to do in one video. Uh, if you clicked on this video because you're having a hard time going through Taylor's book on classical mechanics, then I will try to put some resources in the description. Now this video is not going to be very mathematical at all. I know that that's different for my kinds of videos, but it would be way too long to talk about the conceptual stuff and build the mathematical framework all in one video, but I do want to do that in a future one. But to give you an overall timeline, we're going to start out by very briefly discussing the classical cross-section, then we'll see how things change once we turn on quantum mechanics, We'll talk about the importance and the use of the differential cross-section in nuclear and particle physics by talking about a very simple example. And finally, how differential cross-sections can be used to help discover new particles. Now, I mentioned that the particles don't physically touch. They don't occupy the same space when they scatter. In reality, we describe them as the particles producing a potential that the other particle feels and interacts with and then scatters off of. And in the scattering experiments, what this allows us to do is better understand the nature of the interactions. So classically, if we were to have all of the information about the scattering experiments, such as kinematic information, like the energy and momentum of the incoming particle, and the impact parameter, which is the transverse distance from the trajectory to the scattering center, we can predict exactly where the incoming particle will end up. Experimentally, the concept is exactly the same. Given what comes in, measure what goes out, and you can also keep tabs on where or with what energy. But the interpretation becomes a little bit different. Rather than this probing the size of the target, we understand it to be probing the nature of the form and range of the interaction. And the best way I think to picture this is imagine that these are two charged particles. So the potential would be the Coulomb potential that repels the two charged particles. Now if we were to interpret this as the size, well, this particle is going to scatter even though it's not occupying the same transverse area as the target. So if we were to interpret the cross-section as the size of the target, it would be an overestimate because it's scattering even though it's not occupying that small area. So once we turn on interactions, cross-sections no longer correspond to the size of the target. Theoretically, we still have to have a model in mind that describes the forces that govern the interactions between the particles so that you can extract the impact parameter and make a prediction for the differential cross-section. If that prediction agrees with the experiment, then that's good evidence that we really do understand this interaction, at least classically. Okay, awesome. So we've established that potentials are a thing that exist. Bet you're real glad you clicked on this video. Uh, let's go ahead and leave classical mechanics and enter quantum mechanics. Now, if we have a bunch of tennis balls, I say that, but now we're considering tennis balls, that are directed at a brick wall. It doesn't matter what the energies of the tennis balls are, all that good stuff. They're going to hit the brick wall. They're going to interact. Now, quantum mechanically, if these were quantum particles or a bunch of Schrodinger's cats that we're just throwing at the wall, allow me to demonstrate. No. Um, we know that there's a non-zero probability that the quantum particle just tunnels right through, that it just doesn't interact with the potential. What this corresponds to is that in our definition of the cross-section, the number of scattering events becomes probabilistic. And because of this, the cross-section inherits the interpretation of being the probability of a certain process happening. Now let's turn our attention to the differential cross-section, because especially for nuclear and particle physics, it contains a lot more usable information. But we should describe what it really means. 
And to do that, let's consider an example where we have a spherical cavity that is lined with a bunch of photodetectors, so a bunch of detectors that produce a signal whenever light hits them. So we're going to line our detector with a bunch of, or we're going to line our cavity with a bunch of detectors. And at the center of our cavity, we're going to place a source of electron-positron pairs. So electron-anti-electron -electron pairs. Okay, let's pretend that these detectors are all over uh, the cavity. And here's our electron-positron pair source. Electron-positron. Okay. Now when these electrons and positrons annihilate, they should produce two photons if we're in vacuum. Why two photons? Well, because if the net momentum in the initial state, E minus, E plus, is zero, then it should be that in the final state. If we only produced one photon, well then there's no such thing as a photon with zero momentum. So we should produce another photon with equal and opposite momentum in order for momentum to be conserved. Okay, so let's say that we're only considering, we're only displaying readings when one of the photons hits here. It's this detector. Okay, we then ask, what does the distribution of counts look like for the other photon? So we're doing a coincidence experiment, so we're looking at the other photon that is corresponding to this one being produced as well. So we have enough resolution in our time scale to where the one that we detect will be produced with this one here. Now our detectors are serving the role here as our approximation for the differential cross-section. We have a number of counts spanned by some solid angle range. And if we were to plot the distribution of these counts, which would be proportional to the uh, differential cross-section counts in solid angle space, we're saying one is going here. Conservation of momentum tells us that we're predicting that the other one should go here, right? 180 degrees in this way, 180 degrees that way. I'm just going to write it as 180, and I hope you know what I mean. So the counts should ideally be all at that 180 degree space. Now this isn't a profound example or anything like that. I'm just trying to highlight the point that although differential cross sections can be horribly complicated and abstract to calculate, they always offer some kind of physical insight. They always mean something. In this case, it's, you can think of it as serving the role as a momentum conserving delta function. Now, my experimental nuclear physics professor always liked to remind me that delta functions only exist in the minds of theorists. These detectors are not point-like. They don't have infinite resolution, so there's going to be some broadening in this peak. It'll look something more like this, but the concept is the same. We should see a peak around 180 degrees, and that's telling us that momentum is being conserved. Uh, now, to get the total cross-section, we would have to add up all of the infinitesimal or all of the finite differential cross sections, the number of counts, uh, times the resolution in our detector, which is that equispaced solid angle. So we would have to be adding up all of these guys, doing the area here. And what we see is that not all of these patches of differential cross section contribute the same to the total differential cross section. We can see biases here, we can see a preference in the total cross section or in the differential cross section where most of the contribution is coming from here. In nuclear and particle physics, these biases, these peaks are very interesting and that's going to follow us into our next example that we get to. And you can always use the differential cross section to get to the total cross section. However, going backwards is a lot harder, which is why we like to work with the differential cross section to begin with. You can go from here to here but it's almost impossible to go from here back to the differential cross section. It's analogous to if I measured the yearly rainfall in each individual state and then added it all up to get the total rainfall in the United States. If I just gave you the total rainfall in the United States, you wouldn't necessarily be able to work backwards and tell me how much fell in each individual state. That information is lost. Now, particle physics doesn't actually require that the particles going in will be the same type of particles going out. Uh, certain quantum numbers have to be conserved, depending on the interaction, of course, but um, the same particles in don't necessarily have to be the same particles out. That can happen. For example, you can imagine just electrons scattering off of each other, and in any case, we depict these things, these processes, using Feynman diagrams. So for the simplest case of electron scattering, we have two electrons coming in. Here's our first electron, our second, time being read from left to right and they exchange what's called a virtual photon, 
which takes away some of the momentum and makes the electrons scatter in different directions. E minus. Here's our photon. Um, electron scattering isn't particularly interesting, at least not to me, because they're fundamental particles. There's not that much you can do with them. But then one can imagine what would happen if I took composite particles, like the proton, which is made up of at least three quarks, and I direct them at each other with very high energies. What can I see then? Before we go any further, it's important to define a particle that might be new to you, or a type of particle that might be new to you, called the lepton. Now, a lepton is a spin one-half elementary particle that does not communicate or does not interact with the strong interaction. So, as an example, the electron would be an example, its heavier cousins, the muon and the tau. Uh, the quark is a spin one-half elementary particle, but it communicates via the strong interaction, so the quark would not be a lepton. So, that's just getting the nomenclature out of the way. Then one might ask, what is the cross-section, what is the cross-section, sigma, if I collide two protons to get four leptons out? So we're saying, colliding two protons, what's the probability of measuring four leptons in the final state? That's the total cross-section. If I were to specify this in terms of kinematic variables, then we're specifying the differential cross-section. I could say, what's the probability of measuring the four leptons within this range of solid angle or within this range of energy and momentum? That would be specifying the differential cross-section. But these things aren't Lorentz invariant. They depend on your reference frame. So a nice one to express this stuff in terms of is what's called the invariant mass. If you have one particle, we know that energy squared is equal to m squared c to the fourth plus p squared c squared. Let's drop the factors of c. We're just using natural units, or c is equal to 1, in which case e squared is equal to m squared plus p squared. Solving for the mass, we get m squared is equal to e squared minus p squared. And the mass of a particle doesn't depend on your reference frame. Don't let anyone ever tell you otherwise. If we have a bunch of particles in the final state, like four leptons, then the invariant mass of the four leptons would be equal to the sum of the energies of the four leptons minus the sum of their momentum. And this is a Lorentz invariant quantity, so it's nice to define these differential cross-sections in terms of. Even in our simple example of the electron-positron, we saw biases, we saw a peak in our distribution of the differential cross-section which is interesting. Peaks, when they show up in particle physics and other areas of you know, quantum mechanics, they're usually referred to as resonances. And if we look at the distribution, if we look at the differential cross-section for this process as a function of the invariant mass of the four leptons in the final state, we see this. Now the black dots correspond to actual measurements and the shaded plots correspond to theoretical processes that would contribute to the total cross-section as predicted by the standard model. And we see two peaks, but the one I'm interested in is the one that's centered right around 125 GeV over C squared. I want to know why is that peak there? What physics is trying to be communicated by that peak? And to answer that question, we have to consider one of the theoretical processes that would yield this product here, two protons going to four leptons. Now, protons are made up of quarks. They also have gluons inside of them. And one of the processes has to do with gluon fusion. So we're going to go ahead and draw that Feynman diagram. So what we have is we have two gluons coming in, which are denoted by little springs. And then they exchange a virtual fermion. I think it's probably a quark-anti-quark -quark pair. And then these annihilate and produce the Higgs boson. This Higgs boson then decays into two Z bosons. And then the Z bosons, so I'm going to Z, Z. Then the Z bosons decay into a lepton-anti-lepton -lepton pair. Lepton, anti-lepton. If you think this graph looks gross, just imagine actually calculating it. But at a certain point, we have a Higgs that decays into two Zs, and then down the pipe, we get the four leptons. Now, when a particle decays, it decays in its own rest frame. If you were to ask the Higgs how much energy does it have to produce these Z bosons, it would answer its own mass energy. Uh, it doesn't matter if the particle is moving in your frame. If you were to ask the particle, they would respond with their own rest energy. Any more energy than it takes to create the masses of the particles goes into their kinetic energy. So what's so special about 125 GeV over C squared? That was the predicted mass of the Higgs boson if it existed. 
we see this massive spike in the differential cross-section at this energy because we produced a Higgs boson which served as a source for these four leptons. So this was a massive piece of evidence for the discovery of the Higgs boson because any less than 125 GeV and then we don't have enough energy to create the Higgs in the first place and therefore the rest of the process doesn't happen any more than maybe there are competing processes that are more favorable energetically or whatever the case may be but we see the peak at exactly the mass of the Higgs boson which means we're counting a lot of leptons at the energy that we would expect the Higgs to be produced and then decay. So not only are these biases in differential cross-sections just interesting to begin with, but they can serve as huge indicators uh, for the discovery of new particles. So I hope this helps shed some light on what cross-sections and differential cross-sections are, at least in nuclear and particle physics. In a future video, I'd love to get to the actual math and, and see how these things are actually calculated. Uh, let me know in the comment section if that's something you would want to see. But I hope you guys enjoyed this video. Let me know in the comment section if you did, and I'll see you guys there.